Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski. I will be your host for today. Um, things are going to be a little different than planned for today. So we were expecting uh, to do a hangout with uh, Erica Bergman, uh, submersible pilot. But unfortunately, um, we're short three classrooms this morning, as well as Erica. So. I don't know if there was a time zone mix up or if the weather has kept some of the classrooms in Erica away, but um, we're not gonna have the hangout with Erica today. So I've talked to the classrooms who did make it in live on camera. And what we're gonna do instead is I'm going to talk about my recent trip with National Geographic and Lindblad expeditions to the Galapagos. So I'm gonna share some pictures and some stories from that trip. And for those who've never heard of the Galapagos, uh, it's an absolutely amazing place with incredible animals found nowhere else on the planet. So we're going to see a lot of cool pictures. We'll talk just a little bit about things like invasive species um, and endemic species. So species that are found nowhere else in the world, uh, but certain places. So again, my name is Joe Grabowski and I will be your host and the guest for today. And uh, a little bit about me, I teach grade seven and eight math and science, but I'm also a National Geographic Explorer and a uh, fellow. So I'm actually out of the classroom this year uh, and working on projects with the National Geographic as well as my own project, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And a few years ago, I got an incredible opportunity with National Geographic as a Grosvenor Teacher Fellow. So what this means is each year, National Geographic selects a handful of teachers from across North America who are doing really neat things in their classroom to open their classroom to the world, whether it's through science or geography and things like that. And so I had got to spend some time in Washington with 29 other teachers uh, for a conference and to get to know them. And then they sent us different places all around the world that year. So some teachers went to the Arctic, some went to Antarctica, and I got really lucky. As a science teacher, there's nowhere in the world I wanted to go other than the Galapagos. And that's where they sent me with one other teacher from Alaska. So after our trip, we take our pictures and our video, we make lesson plans. Uh, we share with classrooms, we do presentations. It really is an incredible uh, professional development opportunity. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share my screen. It's just gonna take a second. All right, entire screen. And I'm gonna bring up the Galapagos presentation. So there we go. I'm gonna turn full screen. And if I can just get <clears throat> one of the classrooms just to turn on their microphone and confirm that it went full screen for them and everything looks good. I don't wanna start going through the presentation and not uh, have you guys able to see the slide. So you should see right now a slide of South America. All right, no one's turning on their microphone, so I assume we're okay. Um, if for some reason you don't see the slides, please turn on your mic and let me know. Yeah, we got you. You got it, perfect. All right. So. Uh, the Galapagos is part of the country of Ecuador. So here you can see South America uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, and there's Ecuador. And then about a thousand miles off the coast is this little tiny chain of volcanic islands. And this is the Galapagos. So we flew down to Guayaquil, we spent the night there, and then we hopped a short flight over to the Galapagos. And we'll zoom in a little closer here and we'll get a look at these islands. So here they are, this is the Galapagos and they're a volcanic set of islands, so there's a hot spot. And what that means is there's a spot on the ocean floor where magma or lava is bubbling up. And as it cools, it solidifies and forms these islands. So here's Fernandina. This is the youngest island in the Galapagos and Isabella. And these are still very volcanic islands. But then as you move more to the east, the islands get older and uh, less volcanic. So here's, uh, Espanola and San Cristobal, and they are two of the older islands, and they're no longer volcanic, and they're starting to erode and wear down. So it's like a conveyor belt over uh, tens of thousands of years. These islands that were once over the hot spot have moved away closer to land, and then these new islands form over the hot spot. So over the time there, we landed in Baltra. We spent some time on this little island up here, North Seymour. We spent some time in Rabada. And then we came all the way around and spent time on Isabella, then Fernandina. We came around to Santiago, Santa Cruz, and our very last day was spent on San Cristobal before flying back to the mainland. 
So this was the ship, which has since retired. There's a new ship, the Endeavour 2, but this is the Endeavour, uh, National Geographic ship in partnership with Lindblad Expedition. And there were 90 other uh, people on the vessel with us. And it was a 10 day journey. So you can see these little zodiacs along the side. And these little zodiacs um, were our go-to. So every day, multiple times, we'd jump into these zodiacs, we'd go out to the islands, we'd hike, we'd see different animals, we'd go snorkeling, we'd do little tours along the side of the island from the boat to see all the different birds and marine life. It was a lot of fun and really busy. Go, go, go every day. And the wildlife in the Galapagos is incredible. So being so far from uh, the mainland um, and separated from uh, the original populations, the animals have changed and evolved over time. So on the Galapagos, you find all kinds of endemic species. And what endemic means is found nowhere else uh, on the planet. And the Galapagos is very rich in these types of species. So here are the blue-footed booby. And you can see, obviously, get the name from their feet. And then you can see this one has two chicks that it's feeding. And these feet are pretty important. So when a male wants to attract a mate, the bluer the feet, the healthier the bird. So they show off their feet. They'll lift their leg and, and their feet, and they'll show it to the female. And a, a really nice blue foot means that you get lots of food, lots of pigment from the fish you're eating, and you've got that nice blue color. Shows that you're healthy, and you can get lots of food for the chicks. And you can see this male bird here. He's lifting his foot to show it to a female bird to say, look, at, look how blue this is. Uh, I'm really healthy. And this is another thing that the male birds do. This is called sky pointing. So once in a while, as they lift their feet up and down, they'll point up to the sky and they'll call out. And that's meant to show off as well to the female. And so it was really neat. We watched this bird do his dance, but unfortunately she flew away. So I don't think his feet uh, were blue enough. This is a frigate bird. And this pouch here is pretty cool. It's not normally inflated. Um, it usually looks like a balloon that's deflated. But when they're trying to attract a mate, they puff it up full of air and they can keep it puffed up for two or three days. And then they sit in a tree and every time a female bird flies over, they shake their wings, they call out. And again, they're saying, look how red my chest is. I'm very healthy. Um, I can keep it inflated for multiple days. I'd be a really good mate. Lots of cool creatures on the land. So this is a land iguana and related to the marine iguana on the Galapagos. And they're pretty neat. They have a little cactus, a pear cactus, and that's their little home area. Um, they protect it from other iguanas. And then every once in a while, you can see little cookie cutter bites out of the cactus, and that's their food from time to time. And you can see here is an example. So that's what a prickly pear looks like. And you can see these little cookie cutter bites. Every once in a while, he takes a little snack, and then he sits around in the sun, and defends his tree all day long. The landscape on the islands is pretty incredible. So this is Rabida. You can see it looks red, and that's because the rocks are literally rusting. So the rocks on this island have a lot of iron, and when that's exposed to oxygen and water, it turns this really cool red color. You can see some more of the prickly pear cactus. My favorite part, well, one of my favorite parts of the Galapagos was the snorkeling. So we spent a lot of time in the water, and it's cold and full of nutrients, which means lots of life. So this is a Pacific green sea turtle, and I would say the Galapagos is infested with green sea turtles. Sometimes I'd look around and see 20 or 30 of them uh, in one spot. It was pretty amazing, and they're there for this beautiful, rich green uh, food growing on the rocks. Here's another picture of a Pacific green sea turtle. And then this is pretty cool. It's a, a chocolate chip starfish. And I think you can see where it gets its name from. It looks like it's covered uh, in little chocolate chips. That's pretty neat. These are Galapagos mockingbirds. So there's four different species and they're found on four different islands. And these guys are fearless. They were running right over our legs. They were flying all around us. They were more interested in uh, fighting with each other than paying any attention to us. And that's what it's like in the Galapagos. These animals evolved without humans. So they don't look at humans as predators. And sometimes uh, you literally have to move out of the way or you're going to get trampled by a tortoise or something or a seal 
uh, sea lion because they just don't fear humans. There's a Sally Lightfoot crab. So these guys were all over the shore on these volcanic rocks. That's what these black rocks are, volcanic. And then this is a marine iguana. So these guys are pretty amazing. They're the only iguanas um, or lizards in the world that are adapted to be in salt water. So they warm up at the beginning of the day. They jump into the ocean, swim out, dive down, eat algae from the rocks. They get very cold. They come back up, crawl onto shore, and warm up again. Pretty amazing. So these guys would have evolved from land iguanas in South America. Maybe there was a storm that blew some of them into the ocean. They managed to climb up on some logs or other parts of vegetation and drifted to the Galapagos and over uh, tens of thousands of years changed uh, form into this type of iguana. There's another picture of one enjoying the sun. And then you can see, this is Fernandina, you can see that the food is so rich that some of them don't even have to go into the ocean. They can have a little buffet right along the shore. You can see a few of them taking advantage of that buffet. Again, here's Fernandina, just a beautiful island. You can see, if you look across, you can see the volcanoes of Isabella, which is the biggest island in the Galapagos, kind of looks like a seahorse. And then there's the ship, and we're standing on the volcanic rocks on Fernandina, which is the youngest island in the Galapagos. Here's a flightless cormorant, and these guys are pretty cool. So when they originally would have come to the island, they would have had the ability to fly, like uh, cormorants on the mainland. But with no predators and lots of fish to eat, eventually their wings became vestigial over time, which means they got really small and useless, so they can't fly anymore. But their legs got really big and strong, so they can't fly, but they are like little torpedoes under the water catching fish. And this male has just come back from hunting, and he's got a gift for his mate. He brought this seafood or seafood. He brought this seaweed as a gift for her. And you can see here he is dropping it at the nest. There's two chicks and there's his mate. So that's his nice present after going fishing. He brought her back some seaweed. Now he's warming up and she's getting ready to go out and swim. And it's hard to tell, but there's two chicks there. There's one and the other one's just hiding in behind. This is the tip of the snout of uh, Isabella, the island shaped like a seahorse. And we're crossing the equator at sunset. And you can see these beautiful volcanic cliffs. There's another picture. You can see a cone here. Absolutely incredible um, landscape and amazing to cross the equator right at sunset. It's pretty neat. This is on uh, Isabella as well. This is an old volcanic cone that's become a lake. It's filled with water. You can see way out there uh, the National Geographic Endeavor. And in the background, you can see another volcano. The giant tortoises are pretty amazing. This is probably a medium-sized one. They can get much, much bigger, weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds, live for an incredible long period of time. And as you can see, again, no fear of humans. You can see I'm taking a picture. And then the tortoise turned towards me. You can see another picture. And then eventually I had to roll out of the way, or I would have been trampled in slow motion by this tortoise. You got right up to the camera before I rolled out of the way. Here's another picture of a land iguana, it's kind of sticking its tongue out at the camera. And then this, believe it or not, is the biggest predator on the Galapagos, the biggest natural predator. So this is a Galapagos hawk, and they hunt things like young iguanas uh, and lizards and such, and they are the biggest predator. Now, since men has come to the island, they've brought dogs and cats and other invasive species that don't belong. Um, but before that, these were the top predators in the Galapagos. You can see that the Galapagos is incredibly well protected. Over, I would say, 95% of the island is not of the islands are national park, and nobody can live on them or visit them. Um, there's three or four small areas where uh, humans are allowed to live in little settlements, but most of the Galapagos is kind of beaches and protected areas like this, untouched. There's another picture looking out from, I think this is Santiago looking back at the Endeavor. And then this is kind of cool. It looks like this rainbow is coming right out of the back of the ship and going across the sky. Pretty neat picture. And 
sometimes you get a little carried away. So one day I was doing some snorkeling uh, and they had a glass bottom boat they lowered in the water sometimes because not everybody likes to snorkel. So the glass bottom boat was going back and forth and I decided, you know what, I'm going to show off and swim back and forth and wave to them a few times. And I wasn't paying attention. There's a little bit of rock sticking out from the bottom. And sure enough, I hit my shoulder, but no big deal. The ship's doctor gave me a little antibacterial cream and no problem, right back to business. Here's a little lava lizard on Santiago. This is a male, and then this one's a female. So this is pretty neat. Usually the male of a species is really bright to attract a mate. But in this species of lava lizards, the other way around, the male's kind of drab, where the female has the really bright colors. So that's pretty unique. Everywhere you went in the Galapagos, there were sea lions, which was awesome. So we'd see them in the water, we'd see them on shore. Sometimes they'd be fighting with each other for space. Sometimes we'd see really nice moments like this pup, which is about maybe a week, week and a half uh, old with its mother. And then this is pretty cool. So I'm going back and forth between these two slides and I hope you can see that this marine iguana is sneezing snotty salt water all over the place. And if you're on any of the islands near the shore and there's marine iguanas, you're gonna hear lots and lots of sneezing. And the reason that is, is the food that they eat from the bottom of the ocean is full of salt and they've gotta get that salt out of their body. So they have salt glands in their nostrils and that's where the body pushes the salt out and then they have to sneeze it out. So all day long, you can hear marine iguanas sneezing snot salt all over each other and that's just to get the extra salt out of their bodies. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Puerto Rayero is a town on Santa Cruz. It's the largest area where people live in the Galapagos. And you can see that the animals don't really care either. So I bet nobody's ever gone to the bank and had to step over a sea lion before. But that's what things are like if you live in this city in the Galapagos. The animals come right into the city, especially near the water. We visited some of the more giant tortoises at the um, Charles Darwin Research Station. You can see these are saddlebacks. They've got really long necks and a big lip on their shell so that those necks can reach up and grab food high off the ground. Here's another tortoise up in the highlands of Santa Cruz, having a little munch. And you can see just how big these tortoises get because you've got this one right here, this is a duck. And this duck is only about the size of the back leg of this tortoise. You can see they get really, really big. All right, another tortoise having a little meal in the forest. And this is the last island, San Cristobal. So you can see all the islands look so different, even though they're really close together. And this one's an older island, so a lot of the land is starting to get worn down. You can see hiking through the mountains. There's another species. This is the Nazca booby. And then this is the red-footed booby. So there's three species of booby, the blue-footed, the red-footed, and the Nazca in the Galapagos. This is a frigate bird having a battle with some boobies to try and steal their food. So frigate birds are also called pirate birds because they're lazy. They don't catch their own fish. They bother other birds until they regurgitate their fish and then they eat it. So that's why they're also called pirate birds. You can see the battle still going on, trying to get the birds to spit out their lunch. Another neat shot of the Endeavor. beautiful beaches. Can't tell, but all those bumps over there, all those little black bumps, those are sea lions laying on the beach and just enjoying the sun. Pelicans catching their food, dive bombing. Another picture of another one dive bombing. All right, and that is the end of the slideshow. So I'm gonna come back now and I hope you guys enjoyed that. The Galapagos is just an absolutely incredible place. Um, 10 days was great, but not enough time. Um, what I'll do now is maybe turn the mics on and I'll take some questions. And then if you guys want, I can show you a few scuba diving pictures uh, at the end of the hangout. So let's uh, visit some classrooms. So let's go, let me pull open my class list. Let's start off with Mrs. Jenko's class, grade sixes in Toronto, Canada. 
How are we doing this morning, grade sixes? Doing great. You guys like those pictures? Yes. Excellent. Do you guys have some questions? About how hot is it on the Galapagos Islands? Good question. The Galapagos are right on the equator. And for those who don't know, the equator is like an invisible band that goes around the widest part of the Earth and kind of separates the North and South Hemisphere. And as such, it's always pointing directly at the sun. doesn't matter what season it is. So it's always very hot at um, the equator. So we were there in the rainy season. Um, so it was a little cooler, but most days uh, were in like the high 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, which I think translates to around uh, low 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so it was always nice and warm uh, in the Galapagos, and it didn't rain very much. I think there was one day where it rained for maybe 20 minutes, and then the clouds drifted away. And other than that, it was warm and sunny the whole time. You guys have another question? Luca, yeah, go ahead and ask a question. What was your favorite animal that you saw at the Galapagos? Oh, that's really hard because they were all pretty amazing. Um, if I had to pick, it would be the giant tortoises because when you think of the Galapagos, uh, the giant tortoises come to mind and they've played such an important role for so long in the Galapagos. They're pretty amazing. Um, you know, every island in the Galapagos, they had their they have their own unique species of tortoise, uh, all from original ones that would have drifted to the island way in the past. And unfortunately, they've gone extinct on some islands because sailors uh, would come through. They would take the tortoises for food. You could put a tortoise upside down in the bottom of a ship, and the meat would be fresh for months and months. The tortoise would still be alive on its back and they'd have fresh meat. So unfortunately, many species were lost um, on the different islands of the Galapagos. So being able to see the giant tortoises is pretty awesome. Good question. Mr. Laveau's class, looks like you guys had to switch. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, my, my kids went to uh, went, go to lunch at 11.30 our time. Okay. Um, but I, I do have to say real quick before I, I, um, I get off is, uh, I, I, uh, I spent 17 days uh, in the Galapagos. Um, and, uh, and this was um, in the late 90s, and uh, while Lon Lonesome George was still alive. Yep. And um, and I my and it's funny because my students know that I have a selection of I have photos, and and when when you said you were switching to the Galapagos, they all ran and grabbed my Galapagos photos <laughs> out of a box. But uh, you know, like this is our this is my my Lonesome George picture. Yeah. Um, from when he was still alive. So for classrooms who don't know, Lonesome George was the last of his species uh, on an island, and they looked like crazy to find other females of his species. They couldn't. They thought maybe they could breed him with a similar species to keep the genetic uh, material alive. But unfortunately, it didn't work out. And a few years ago, uh, Lonesome George did pass away. So it's always sad to see the last of a species disappear. Yeah, absolutely. But it's... Uh... I, uh, I definitely encourage anybody that uh, that gets a chance. It's definitely uh, an amazing uh, an amazing adventure. No um, question. It's, it's certainly one of the trips that I, I will never forget. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing. I'm glad it's. I'm glad the class had those pictures. They were able to grab them and and. Oh, they knew they knew right where to go. They were they were excited. Although they seemed to know a lot about the Galapagos, so they were because of my stories. But they were yeah. certainly excited to hear that that was a good plan B. Excellent. Well, I'm sorry the plans changed today, but. I'm guessing it's weather related to lose three classrooms is uh, a lot. So it must be weather related, unfortunately. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in anyways. It was great to have you joining in and thanks for sharing. Thank you. All right. Our next class, Mrs. Uh, DeShaney's class, they're joining us from uh, Bristol, Connecticut, uh, grade threes. How are you doing, grade threes? Yeah. Cool. Did you like those pictures? Yeah. Yeah, they were really cool. Excellent. Well, thanks for staying in and hanging out, and I'd love to hear some of your questions. Um, I have to ask, are there any Galapagos animals that you didn't see there, or any animals that you, that you think 
would look cool in the Galapagos if the animals from our world went to the Galapagos and they like did the same kind of metamorphosis the Galapagos the Galapagos animals did? Okay, those are some good questions. So first of all, let me start with other animals going to the Galapagos. So uh, I'm sure you all know what invasive species are. So invasive species are animals that get places where they don't belong, whether it was by accident or humans bring them there intentionally. And certain things can happen. Sometimes there's no change. It doesn't make a big difference. Um, but sometimes it can be a really bad thing. And those species get on the island and they change the whole ecosystem and really hurt the species that belong there. So let me give you a good example. There's, um, it's called a uh, marsh finch, and there's only about 40 of them left. And these finches um, are being wiped out by a fly, believe it or not. So this little fly that was introduced to the islands, maybe it came over on some fruit, maybe uh, it was brought over accidentally, um, but they get into the nests and then they feed on the little chicks. They kind of poke away at them uh, and eventually kill them. So these little flies are having this huge impact. So in the Galapagos, they want to try to get rid of them, but they have to be careful because whatever they use can't kill the native insects. So it's hard to find something that just kills one kind of bug. And then at the same time, with only 40 birds left, they have to collect the birds from um, the, the, the eggs from the wild and then raise them in captivity. And then right from a chick and then release them. But that's hard too. That costs, each chick can cost about $20,000 to raise. So it's a real tough juggling act they're doing because of invasive species, trying to find ways to get plants and other animals that don't belong off of the island without hurting the animals that do belong. So um, the Galapagos, when these islands formed, were just bare rock, uh, volcanic islands. And over long periods of time, uh, seeds would have drifted from the mainland, birds would have flown from the mainland, and then species like reptiles, which there's lots of reptiles in the Galapagos, different lizards and tortoises and such, they would have drifted to the Galapagos. They would have been lucky survivors who were swept off the mainland in a storm and drifted over. So technically everything on the Galapagos is an invasive species, but they've been there so long and they've changed so much that obviously they're now the native species. So we don't really want to bring anything new there. And then your question about what I didn't see, um, the Galapagos has penguins, which is pretty cool. You normally hear of penguins living in really cold areas, but because the Galapagos is hot, but really cold ocean currents, penguins can survive there. And they're called Galapagos penguins. And so I really wanted to see them. And we did on one of our last days, we saw two of them on the shore when we were in the little Zodiac. And unfortunately, I got kind of one blurry picture and then both of them jumped into the water and swam away. So I really didn't get to see them the way that I wanted to. Those are some good questions. You guys have another one? Yeah. John. Oh, thank you. Thank you. What was your favorite this island that you've been on? Oh, that's easy. All the islands are pretty cool, but Fernandina was my favorite. So Fernandina, uh, is the youngest island in the Galapagos. It's still very volcanic. And it's an island that didn't have uh, any natural fresh water on it. So the sailors and people in the past weren't really interested in it. If there's no water, it's not really worth stopping. They'd rather go to an island that had some fresh water and then they could refill their, their water tanks or whatever on the ship. So Fernandina is young and really full of life. So it's kind of like looking at an island that hasn't been um, affected as much as the other ones by humans. So just to give you an example, so I showed you one picture looking at the ship and then you could see the volcanoes on the other island in the background. So in that little spot, there were marine iguanas all around me. There were sea lions basking on the shore. There were two Galapagos hawks in the tree. Off to my other side was a nest with those flightless cormorants. And then in the water were dozens of sea turtles just floating on the surface of the water. So in that moment, it was pretty incredible to be somewhere so far into the middle of the ocean um, and surrounded by life and seeing what the Galapagos probably looked like all over uh, before people came and started um, using the island. So 
that was definitely my favorite island. Let's go back to Mrs. Jenko's class. Do you guys have another question? Um, we, we grabbed our lunches because it's our lunch too, but we stayed with you. What That's I think, okay. <laughs> That's okay. So what have been the, the changes most recently in the Galapagos as far as species uh, go with the changes in our in our um, and I guess global warming and, and what kind of dramatic changes have we seen most recently? Okay. So there's there's a few things happening. I'm sure you guys have heard of uh, maybe El Nino. So this is um, kind of unnatural warming of the water, um, which can cause a lot of changes. So uh, for example, um, the Galapagos is really nutrient rich the waters. And it's cold upwelling of these waters that brings the nutrients to the surface and can support a lot of sea life. But when the water warms up uh, at a time of the year it's not supposed to, or in a way it's not supposed to, that can affect a lot of the species that do live in the Galapagos. So I already mentioned the Galapagos penguins. They can live on the equator because of this really cold, rich wa nutrient rich water. But if the water warms up, they can't survive. They're not. Uh, adapted to be in water that warm. So it has caused the numbers of penguins to drop uh, significantly. Another neat thing is I showed you pictures of the sea lions, but the Galapagos is also one of the only places you can find sea lions and fur seals. Now fur seals have a thicker coat and they like the cold water so they can survive in the Galapagos because of that cold nutrient-rich nutrient -rich waters. And um, once those waters start to warm up, then it's not an ideal habitat and it starts to affect them as well. Other things that changing uh, climate can do uh, and different temperatures in the water is change uh, the rainfall. So the Galapagos only has a few spots where you can find uh, fresh water and then they depend on rainwater as well. But with things getting warmer um, and climate patterns changing, they're not getting as much rain. And then that puts a strain on the islands puts a strain on the animals living on the island when they can't find enough water. So there's just a few things that are happening uh, in the Galapagos. And then let's jump back to Mrs. DeShaney's class. You guys have another question. What was the smallest animal you saw there? Uh, the smallest? Well, I guess I'll the leave out insects mm -hmm. because obviously we saw lots and lots of insects. Um, Let's see the smallest, probably some of the finches. So, uh, you know, there's famous stories about Charles Darwin, uh, who was a scientist who took a voyage around the world in a ship called the Beagle. It took many, many years. Um, and all along the way, he was collecting different animals from different spots that people had never visited before and making all kinds of really cool discoveries. And one thing he collected in the Galapagos was finches. And so these finches in the Galapagos all had different types of beaks. Sometimes they were thin, sometimes they were really thick. Um, and it turns out that their beaks are adapted to whatever they eat. Maybe it's seeds, they need really strong beaks to crunch them. Maybe it's insects, so they don't need those really uh, thick beaks. They can have thinner ones to catch the insects. There's even a species that hunts with a tool. There's a finch that takes uh, needles off a cactus and then they stick it into holes in uh, trees and they stab grubs and other uh, insects and then they eat them off of the tool. So all kinds of different ways that the finches get their food. And so um, the Galapagos finches were probably the smallest kind of animals and they were really cool. And obviously they get a lot of credit in history as helped Darwin um, uh, kind of discover or create his theory of evolution. Um, but there are many other species like the tortoises and the mockingbirds that played a role, but they don't get as much uh, publicity as the finches. So I don't know how much time you guys have left. Um, maybe you have to go, but uh, if you want, I can share a couple scuba pictures before we sign off. Yeah. 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 So Mrs. DeShaney's class is in. What about Mrs. Jenko's class? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So maybe I'll share five minutes or so of scuba pictures. So just give me a second while I share my screen. Uh, and I'll just take a second. There we go. Entire screen. Share. Um, 
Okay, so you should see it now. I'm going to go full screen. And so I lived in Australia for a year in 2007, and that's where I started scuba diving. And that's pretty much my favorite thing to do. Um, I've been diving all around the world, and this is actually a picture from my very first dive uh, in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef. So it's kind of neat to have a picture from your very first dive. And this is kind of a scuba selfie. This is when I was diving in Mexico in a place called Cozumel. And then sometimes I just snorkel or free dive, so without any equipment. So this is on Fraser Island in Australia, and there was this beautiful lake called Lake Mackenzie. And if you dive down about 25 feet, the bottom of the lake was covered in turtles. So I brought one of them up to get a closer look, and then I went back down and put the turtle back uh, where I found him. Sometimes you come across things that don't belong in the water, like this bike. And this is at a training lake in Ontario. And so you can combine two sports, a little scuba cycling. And so diving on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia was pretty amazing. So it's the longest, uh, it's the largest um, natural structure on the planet, but it's actually a whole series of reefs uh, and islands. It's not just one big long uh, reef. And it's also um, pretty full of life, but it's also pretty uh, in trouble right now. So if you haven't heard of coral bleaching, as the water warms, it gets too warm for the coral and they start to lose their beautiful color um, and they become bleached, they turn white. And if the water doesn't cool down in time, they eventually do die. There are some parrotfish. Here's a little story for you about parrotfish. When you're on the reef, it's not quiet. It's very loud in the water. You hear crunch, 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 crunch of these parrotfish eating away at the coral. Then when the fish poop, the waste is sand. So whenever you're on a nice sandy beach in a tropical area, remember that you're actually on parrotfish poop. The parrotfish are responsible for that sand when they grind up the coral and then poop out the sand that they can't digest. So think about that next time you're on the beach. There's some clownfish, right? Like Finding Nemo. This is a giant clam. It doesn't look giant in the picture, but it's actually over a meter uh, long, this clam. Green sea turtle. You can see the beautiful colors of the, a nice, healthy coral reef. And then this is a nice young sea turtle. Uh, no kind of algae or barnacles growing on its back. Uh, so a really neat picture, some really good color. Spotted stingray, you can see the blue spots. This is a nudibranch, and these guys are pretty cool. Their name comes from naked lungs, because right here at the back, you see these little frills, that's their lungs. Their lungs are outside of their body, um, and they take oxygen from the water. So naked lungs, nudibranchs. This is a cuttlefish, looks kind of like a combination between an octopus and a squid. And they're pretty cool. They're pretty curious. There's another picture of the cuttlefish. And it's not cuddle like DD, -D, it's cuddle like C U T T L E, cuttlefish. Here's a uh, stonefish, and these are beautifully camouflaged uh, and then covered in little spikes with venom. So you definitely don't want to touch uh, one of these in the water. Now it looks easy to see now because it's lit up with the the flash from the camera, but uh, without the flash, it blends in very nicely with the bottom of the ocean. I did some diving in Fiji, so you can see a white tip reef shark. And there's a couple other reef sharks as we were going down the line. A couple from above, or sorry, from below. Some neat little blennies, so this is uh, a pair and they mirror each other's movements almost perfectly. So that's pretty darn cool. A little diving in Cozumel. There's an arrow crab. So it always pays to look inside of things, look inside of sponges, look in little caverns, because you can find little uh, neat things like this arrow crab. We swam through some different caves in the reefs, which was pretty cool. There's a spotted moray eel. This is a nurse shark. So during the day, they rest at the bottom of their caves, and then at night they come out to hunt. And I've got a picture of one at night that I can show you in a second. Got some schools of fish. 
Here's a Stingray, who's pretty hard to see, pretty good camouflage. And it gets even better when they shake a little bit and a little bit of that kind of sand from the bottom covers them. You can see that he's got pretty good camouflage. Splendid Toadfish. So this is another endemic species, which means it's found nowhere else except for around the island of Cozumel. And these guys come out at night as well. And you can't tell, but it's actually quite a long fish. There's much more fish behind, but it's uh, tucked away in a cavern. Here's a hawksbill sea turtle, so a different species. This is a baby one. It's about the size of a dinner plate. And then here's a night dive. So here's a little lobster on the reef at night. You can see this nurse shark just disappearing from my spotlight. Kind of hard to see. And then my favorite was we followed this octopus. This octopus came out at night to hunt, and we watched it change colors. We watched it change shape. We watched it pounce on little crabs and other creatures. It was really fun to watch this octopus do some hunting. And then at night as well, there's all these little worms in the water. And they love the spotlight. So they come all over the spotlight. They're attracted to the light. Another moray eel. There's a puffer fish. So here's a puffer fish when it's relaxed. But then when it's frightened, it fills up with water. So our, our dive master that day, he, he waved his hand in front of the puffer fish. And this is how it reacted. It filled itself with water and puffed up uh, to protect itself. You definitely wouldn't want to snack on that. And a couple little rays. All right, so I think we should probably stop there. I know some of the classrooms have to are starting on their lunches and such, but uh, maybe I'll visit each class. If you guys have maybe one question about uh, diving, I can take a question from each class. So let's start with Mrs. Jenko's class. Well, have you ever seen one of those fish that have like these lights on on their he head and in like they're found in the dark darker? for areas of the sea. All right, so that's a good question. And those fish are really, really cool. So unfortunately, when you dive, uh, a recreational diver can only go to about 130 feet. And then any deeper than that, uh, you have to get into technical diving. And even that, you know, once you get into the 200 uh, feet deep is getting really deep. So unfortunately, those fish live really, really deep in the ocean and um, they don't really come into the light. And the reason they have that little lure on the front uh, is to attract fish in the darkness. So fish are attracted to that little bit of glowing. They come in close to see what it is and bam, they're lunch. So <laughs> unfortunately to see one of those, uh, you usually have to be in like a submersible. So like a little underwater sub to get that deep to see it. That's a really good question. Uh, Ms. Deshaney's class. Okay, we have, to, go we to, have lunch. to run to lunch right now, too, but thank you very much. What do we say, boys and girls? Thank you! Thank you. I'm sorry that the plans changed, but I hope you got to see a little bit and you learned a little bit, too. All right. Thank you. See ya. All right. Well, Mrs. Jenko's class, if you guys have one more question, and then we'll sign off for today. One more question. Go for it. What's the What's your favorite fish that you saw in Cozumel? Hmm. Um. Well, I was pretty excited to see the splendid toadfish. So, um, the splendid toadfish is only found in Cozumel. So there's nowhere else that you can go to see it, and they usually are only seen at night. So it was really lucky that we were. Uh, going along the bottom and we happen upon a cavern with that splendid toadfish right at the front and then I also like it because it stayed long enough to get that really cool picture that really nice close-up picture so I was pretty excited about that and then many of you may not know this but sharks are actually fish as well and so I'd never been diving with a nurse shark before so it was really neat to um, to be able to see a nurse shark so that was pretty cool Guys. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, guys, thanks again for hanging out. I know things didn't go as planned today, but uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed some of the pictures and stories. And uh, obviously, we hope to see your class again. Thank you very much. Thank you very right. much. Thank you. Thanks, boys and girls. Bye. See ya. Bye.